Yeah, thank you everyone also from my side. And just to start off, I'd like to ask you three questions and just raise your hand if the answer is yes. So who of you knows something about reinforcement learning? That's really good because I don't really have a slide about what is reinforcement learning. I kind of <laughs> assume that the audience knows it already. And then two other questions maybe concatenate into one. Who knows or plays StarCraft or Dota 2? Well, more people know about reinforcement learning than about Dota or StarCraft 2, it seems, uh, which is a good thing for, for this conference. But in order to start off this presentation, I'd like to go through the applications of reinforcement learning that you might see outside of the academic domain. And what better way to do that than to look through non-technical uh, publications and different magazines. And let's just start off with uh, The Wired. It's an article from 2015. Google's AI is now smart enough to play Atari like the pros. They don't call it reinforcement learning, but it is exactly what it is. Moving on to 2017. DeepMind's AI became a superhuman chess player in a few hours just for fun. Well, I don't think it was just for fun, but for some reason they decided to put it like that. And then, quite recently, DeepMind's AI agents conquer human pros at StarCraft II. So, January 24th, 2019. And then moving on to April, April 19th, OpenAI's Dota 2 team is crushing humans online, but players are not giving up. Well, let's see how did the players do, because two days later, the article came out, which has, has a headline like this. Dota AI 2 defeated 99.4% of all players in public matches. So I guess the 0.6% did not give up in the end. But, well, you see these headlines, and you kind of notice they're all about games. Where are the Google machine translation uh, applications of uh, reinforcement learning, like Google Machine Translation uses NLP. Where's the image search applications of uh, reinforcement learning, like image uh, search uh, uses convolutional neural networks and computer visions? Well, I'll save you the digging, and I'll show you one of the most impressive applications of reinforcement learning so far. And it kind of looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> if I like cheap jokes, I'd say reinforcement learning seems to have hit a wall here. <laughs> and you seem to like those jokes as well. But welcome to my talk. We'll hear, we'll talk about why don't you see actually many real world applications of reinforcement learning. I'm Yuri Tolojko. As the presenter told me, you can contact me on email and LinkedIn and on GitHub. I'll upload the slides by tonight. At least I hope by, by Monday for sure. And you might see that I work at BSF, and you might think, what does BSF, a chemical corporation, even have to do with reinforcement learning? And the answer to that question is really simple. I'm not allowed to reveal corporate secrets. <laughs> but if you listen to this talk closely enough, you'll be able to make an educated guess yourself. And do keep in mind that the talk isn't called why you do see many re applications of reinforcement learning. So we'll t we can talk about this in the Q&A or afterwards. Right. Having done away with that introduction, I'll just ri jump right into the five problems that I've identified and people in the literature identified as well. I will just walk th one by one and discuss why is it difficult for reinforcement learning to jump across these, this game pond and why it doesn't it seem to be a problem in, in these games. So the biggest problem perhaps, and the one I would like to start off with is sample inefficiency. Sample inefficiency means how much data does an algorithm need in order to be able to solve a task. And in reinforcement learning context, data doesn't come from data sets. And we'll talk about this problem later on. It comes from interaction with an environment. And this interaction with an environment might be costly or might be not so costly. So in terms of simulated environments, as games are, it only requires computational power. But think, for example, of an online shop that wants to employ a reinforcement learning technique in order to set pricing on the things that it sells. It has to make suboptimal actions in order to explore, in order to generate this interaction, and it has to consciously make actions that it knows that aren't optimal. And I don't think any online shop would set prices that it knows are not optimal 
just in order to think that maybe sometime in the future, in five years, I'll be able to make an optimal action at some point. So if you don't have a good simulator of environment, it's going to be hard to adjust to this reinforcement learning pipeline. And just to go through the algorithms that we showed, like these Atari games, StarCraft, Dota, let's see how much interaction does it really require in order to get to like appreciate the scale. So DQN is deep Q networks for those who are more technical. Uh, it's Rainbow DQN is the paper com came in 2017 is the state of the art application of this algorithm. And it needs to, in order to, to reach the 100%, which is the average human performance, it needs 18 million frames of gameplay. At 60 FPS, it's 83 hours. You might think 83 hours doesn't sound too bad of real-time play, but consider how much a human needs in order to play Space Invaders on an average level. I'd say a couple of minutes. And it needs 83 hours. Moving on to OpenAI 5, which is the Dota 2 player or five players, five agents. This is like really, it really starts to get scary here. So they, ha they had 128,000 CPUs, 256 GPUs, which isn't really that much, uh, if, uh, all things considered. And they generated 900 years of Dota 2 experience per day. So in general, all in all, they had 45,000 years of experience, which spent over 10 months, because, of course, they had the resources to sim simulate Dota that quickly. But if you or, or I or anybody in this uh, conference would try to do it, they'd probably just take Dota 2 engine, and there would be no way to generate 45,000 years of experience, because by then, people would probably don't, wouldn't care about reinforcement learning anyway. And then, then this graph also from Dota 2. You see that there's more or less a linear relationship between computing power on the X scale and the true skill, which is like a skill measurement on the Y scale. Except you see that the X scale is log logarithmic. Oh, I said logistic. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's, it has to say logarithmic. Uh, so there's an exponential increase in compute power and a linear increase in true skill, in the skill level. So it's not quite as efficient and it's not quite as sustainable if you don't have these massive resources uh, that OpenAI to uh, OpenAI has. And OpenAI actually admitted in their blog post that the biggest increase uh, it doesn't come from the algorithms that they developed. The biggest increase comes from the money that they poured into Google Compute. And then moving on to StarCraft 2, each dot represents an agent. So one of these dots actually then played against a human. The, the best dots, so to say. Actually, it was a concatenation of different dots, but for our purposes, we can think of one dot as an agent. And a each agent was trained up to 14 days with 16 TPUs, and in the span of those 14 days, each agent played 200 years of StarCraft play. So 600 agents, 200 years, 120 years of real-time play in human terms. And I think I've driven my point pretty deep, and I think you realize by now that sample inefficiency is a big problem, and the only real solution to the sample inefficiency is just stack more compute power on top of it, which isn't really that sustainable, especially not for the huge powerhouses like DeepMind, which belongs to Google, or OpenAI, which just has a lot of money, too. And unlike in supervised learning, why does reinforcement learning have this specific problem? Because supervised learning still needs a lot of data, but not quite as much. We don't need to train, I don't know, a ResNet for 45,000 years. We just have it train overnight if we have a couple of GPUs. The problem is that we never see the true values. We never see the ground truths. We generate the data from experience, and we estimate the ground, we estimate the actions that we make, but we never actually, nobody actually tells us this action is good, this action is bad we kind of make this judgment ourselves based on the experience. And when we improve the policy, we have to make the judgments all from the start. And then there's this vicious cycle. It's not actually a cycle, it's more like a spiral, because in the end it does converge on the optimal policy, but it takes a very long time to do so. And this is very different from supervised learning, and this is one of the big reasons why you don't see smaller companies employing reinforcement learning and their productive environments. Just one of the five that I've gotten to mention. 
Now you might think, transfer learning, if it takes a long time to train an algorithm, why not employ transfer learning? For those who might not know what transfer learning is, is the idea is you take something that was trained on one data set, you freeze most of it, and then you retrain the last parts in order to adapt it to the new data set that you might have. Well, no such thing in reinforcement learning. Right now you have to believe me, but uh, I'll talk about why, but for new, every new such task of reinforcement learning, every new environment, every new game, every new whatever you have, you have to actually start from zero knowledge, zero priors. So just as a recap, transfer learning might look like this. For a computer vision task, this is a kind of multi-layer convolutional neural network. You freeze the first layers, and then you retrain the top layers in order to adapt your already pre-trained network on ImageNet, for example, to your specific smaller data set. In uh, word embeddings, an NLP are also a, an example of transfer learning because you don't need to train the word embeddings, you just download them from Google or whatever. If you like word to vac it's Google. If you like Glove, it's from Stanford NLP. And they are just there. You don't need to spend your resources to, to do it. Well, in reinforcement learning, like I said, we don't have data sets, we have environments. So they might look like this. This is like an actual environment that you have to train. This is this isn't just a visualization. Then breakout, but you also have some more difficult ones, like this half cheetah it's called. So you have to make this pipe-like cheetah run because at first, this is an example of a well-trained environment. And then you have a very difficult one like this humanoid. And nobody supplies us the ground truths. And since, since there are no data sets, there's no direct notion of transfer learning. There's some research about transferring some prior knowledge right now, but it's very early, and as it, as it stands right now, even if your algorithm works well on, let's say, space invaders, you wouldn't expect it to work at all on breakout. It might, but that would be just a matter of chance. Next problem, reward signal. This is the central idea of reinforcement learning. This is what kind of defines reinforcement learning, I'd even say. Reward is where our agent tries to maximize over the whole run, from first step to the terminal step, and ideally the reward must uh, capture our end goal exactly. So, case in point, mastering Atari games, the reward is the score that we achieve. With every step, we improve our score by 5, the reward is 5, we improve our score by 50, the reward is 50, and in the end of goal, in order to win the game, we must maximize the score. So here, the reward is the thing that we want to maximize doesn't get better than that. This is exactly what we want to have. Let's think of alpha zero. Here, the reward is simpler yet. Plus one for winning the game, minus one for losing the game, and zero for draw. And it works. <laughs> so a solution to every reinforcement learning problem, considering the success of alpha zero, set plus one for a successful completion of a task, set minus one or zero otherwise, and just solve any problem you might have if it were only that easy. And observe the emergence of a general <laughs> artificial intelligence is what I added this morning. Well, for any real reinforcement learning task, not gaming related where you don't have, where you have many states and many actions and not, of all act not many of those actions lead to a terminal state, you have to define some reward function that makes intermediate steps. You can't just rely on plus one for the terminal action and zero for everything else. We need reward shaping. And, cre and creating this reward function, shaping this reward, is very difficult because we want the algorithm to use this reward function to achieve what we want it to achieve. And it only can maximize the reward. So we need to make this reward somehow work in such a fashion that it actually achieves what we think it will achieve. This is very difficult. So an example is this game. The reward here is maximizing the high score. And the agent is the boat, of course. And what you'll see it does, it needs to get to the end of the track. But what you'll see it does, it just collects these green boosters. Because it increases this high score that much that the agent doesn't even really care about getting to the end of the goal. It's just gonna, it just gonna roll around, roll around, add infinitum, and create and collect these boosters. So it maximizes this high score. 
but it doesn't really care about winning. And we want it to care about winning. So this is an example of a failed shape reward. I'm not going to make it struggle to the end. <laughs> so another, another uh, example of a failed shape reward is this half cheetah. So expectation is this. This is an example of a well-solved environment. And what it looks in reality is something like this. And from a mathematical point of view, this agent still collects a lot of reward. But does it really look like what we want it to look like? I disagree. From a reinforcement learning perspective, it still works quite well. A couple of more. <laughs> and this is the one that's most human-like. But still not quite, right? So there's a problem with no seeming solution because we need a reinforcement learning to maximize the uh, reinforcement learn, uh, learning agent to maximize the reward, but it doesn't mean that it will do the thing that you want to do eventually in the end by maximizing this reward. And in some cases, the reward might be logically even connected to the thing that you wanted to maximize, like an example of the boat, but it still does something completely different, something that you would have never expected when you set it out. And in the end, it's a matter of finding a balance between a sparse reward so that the agent actually moves towards the end goal. So a sparse reward would be just plus one for the for successfully finishing a goal. And given these intermediate-shaped rewards uh, that, you, that you've seen uh, with this high score in order for the agent to actually learn anything. Next and related thing is exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Fundamental problem, do I explore or do I exploit? I need to make suboptimal actions, actions that I know that are suboptimal, in order to be able to see if there are better actions out there. Like in the example that I gave in the very beginning with the shop. I need to make something that I know that is, this is going to like cost me money in case of a shop, in order to know that in the end of the day, it might bring me even more money. Might not. So this is the whole idea of exploration. And it's a trade-off. There's no clear, there's no solution to this trade-off. You just have to Take, take it as it is. And it turns out random exploration is still kind of the best way there is to explore. There are all these difficult algorithms that are even hard to understand. And then there's this paper, Simple Random Search Provides a Competitive Approach to Reinforcement Learning. Came out in 2018. Kind of flew under the radar of the reinforcement learning community. The algorithm looks like this. So the, the juicy parts are here and then the update step. Basically, it's simply a, it's simply a matter of a, a little augmented random search. So random search, search is just you take a step in one direction and then see if it was good or bad. Then you take a step in another random direction, see if it was good and bad, then update your, update your preferences, your policy in such a matter. So no fancy evolution strategies, no fancy uh, genetic algorithms, just a simple random search. And this is how it works. So these these are the environments that I show you: the half cheetah, walker, swimmers, and hoppers. I didn't see, I didn't show uh, IRS. And these are the fancy algorithms: PPO, proximal policy optimization. This is the thing that solved Dota. Then TRPO, trusted region policy optimization, actor to critic. And you see that the numbers here, except for the walker, are actually higher. And this is a simple, a very simple algorithm that takes maybe 50 times less computational power than the ones that are shown here to the right. So this is weird. And this is, I was very surprised not to see a big uproar in the reinforcement learning community. And the, but this augmented random search beats, or at least is on par with the state of the art algorithm. What this means is that, first of all, we're not very good at exploring better than random. We're, we can't explore better than random. It also means that if a simple algorithm beats all our benchmarks, the benchmarks are pretty pretty poor. It's like having MNIST for computer vision and not having anything higher. On MNIST, we have 99.5% accuracy right now. And if that's all we had, there wouldn't be any improvement. And this is the probably the situation that we have in reinforcement learning right now. So we need new and more rigorous ways to test the reinforcement learning algorithms. And then the problem, probably the biggest one, is seed and hyperparameter sensitivity. 
it's an issue of reinforcement learning that people just started to tackle on, just started to like catch wind of it, because before people just submitted articles, uh, people just submitted algorithms to the relevant publication, and they were just accepted without giving much thought to the sensitivity to seed and hyperparameters. And we'll walk through why that is a big problem. So basically, the way stuff works right now is that you have your algorithm, you take three to five random seeds. So you have three to five uh, rounds of your algorithm, and you look at the best one, and you publish the results with the best one in reinforcement learning because it's it costs way too much. It takes way too long to run an algorithm, so it's understandable that people in, uh, I don't know, in PhDs or master's students don't have the money, the universities don't supply the money to actually run the algorithm maybe a hundred times. It's understandable, but it doesn't make it less of a problem. So this covers a pretty significant problems that are the reinfor that the algorithms are very sensitive. So I hope you can see the colors, but maybe not the descriptions. So I'll just read off the descriptions for you. So here we have same algorithm, same code, different activation functions. And you see the average return. Return is the sum of reward over the whole run. And you can see that the blue, the red, and the yellow are actually quite significantly different. Here, you also have different activation functions. And here, the biggest difference comes from a PPO, so Proxima Policy Optimization. The algorithm doesn't matter really that much, but there's the idea is that there's a neural network in there. And if you have a different hyperparameter settings, so number of layers and number of neurons in the layer, you have a vastly different performance. So this red and this blue might as well be two different algorithms, really. But they're the same code, the same implementation, the same hardware, just two different hyperparameters. Same algorithm, but different implementations, for example. Trusted region policy optimization, DDPG, so TRPO and DDPG. Three different code bases of the same algorithm, same implementation. Some of the smartest people in the world did this code. So like PhD students uh, or people from research uh, units of different companies. And you can see that these might as well be different algorithms. So something's wrong. It can't be that people who are more or less on the same level read the same papers, have the same background, write the same, uh, try to implement the same algorithm, and then you have this. This is just this is, isn't just um, just a one-time occurrence. So this comes from a different publications publication, and you'll see the sources for every publication here down below if you want to check it out for yourself after I, uh, I submit the slides to, to GitHub. And you'll see that there are these um, there are these error bars. And the error bars are suspiciously close to zero, which means that I think it was 25 percentile, 25 percent of the time, the algorithm just doesn't work. It's just random. And then this comes from the augmented random search too. So these are the environments, half cheetah, humanoid, hopper, ant, walker, swimmer, whatever. And you see these are the percentiles. And for most of them, some of the percentiles Pretty high ones, for example, here it's, th uh, it's 20 to 20 percent here touches zero. So it means that 20 percent of your time of the time, your algorithm doesn't do anything. So imagine in computer vision, your algorithm works well 80 percent of the time, or it works at least somehow 20 percent of the time. Your image recognition 20 percent of the time, it just doesn't manage to even pick up on random noise, like it, it doesn't manage to go higher than random noise. And I'm pretty sure that if you ran uh, your computer vision image recognition algorithm 100 times on the same data set with the same code, you'd have the same result 100% of the time. Maybe a matter of a margin of error of 3 5%. Not like it works or it doesn't. And then alpha zero, the algorithm that everybody likes and knows. And it's a pretty simple one. It takes maybe like 150 lines of code to, to implement for me and for people who know what they're doing, maybe even less. Uh, so you see that there are no error bars. So 
two reasons. Either the errors are so small that they don't even fit on the on the graph, or there are no error bars because they only reported one run of the algorithm. And it's the second reason. And they were called out on it on the conference, and they said, yeah, internally we tried a lot, but we only reported one run. <laughs> I don't know. If you tried a lot, then why do you only report one run? So basically, all these impressive results that we see about beating uh, Go play, best Go player and best chess and shogi uh, algorithms, because algorithms are way better than uh, best players by now in chess and shogi, this is just a result of one single run. So we, we don't know if they were to try it again, if it would work, if it would not. Perhaps it wouldn't, given the given the sensitivity of the other algorithms to reinforce uh, to seed and hyperparameter uh, alterations. So deep reinforcement res results are actually not that reproducible. Due to intrinsic and extrinsic factors, of course, they are rarely reproducible. And so you see algorithms that seem to work really well. They seem to be really impressive when they work. But some of the time, and a lot of the time, they actually don't. And this is also a very thing that's very intrinsic to reinforcement learning that you don't see in supervised learning. And it comes from the same problem of data sets versus environments, of ground truths versus uh, uh, interaction with the environment. So your ResNet, for example, would work the same, you'd expect it to work in the same way if it's implemented in the same way on the same data set. But in the environments, it's a whole different game because you have your interaction that's dependent on your, uh, for example, neural network, if you've, opti if you've uh, parameterized your policy by neural network. So your neural network and all the randomness that happens in neural network directly affects the interaction. And that interaction is what contributes to your data, the reward and the new state and the transition that you have. So your randomness that influences your neural network directly influences your data that you generate live on the go. And the data that gen you generate live then influences the neural network because you update it with a new return, and then so on, so on, so on. So the smaller st alterations not only influence your neural network, but also the data generation, which, which data generation then uh, influences the neural network, and then it goes like that in a vicious cycle, and that's why you see this convergence. Oh, divergence, sorry. You see convergence in the algorithm, but if you look through different implementations of the algorithm or different hyperparameters or different seeds even with the same hyperparameters, you see a huge divergence because of this amplification of error, amplification of randomness that goes in this cycle. So the problem here is that even if you, if you want to employ a reinforcement learning algorithm, in production, you look through papers, you see, okay, this algorithm works the best, then you implement it, or you take the reference implementation and set a random seed or set a hyperparameter setting, and it might work like a completely different algorithm in the end. So there, you can't be sure that if you take the best algorithm, the best performing algorithm, you can't be sure that it's gonna be performing quite that well on your data set uh, or your data set was even a wrong word to use, on your task, on your environment that you have, that you have developed for the reinforcement learning agent to tackle on. This is a big problem. So you might be thinking by now, this guy seems to criticize a lot, but doesn't offer any solutions. And the hard and sad truth is that I don't have any solutions. In my defense, I don't think anybody right now has any solutions to these problems. I'm just here to like draw attention to the problems and draw attention to the problems that we should be tackling on if we wanna have reinforcement learning work well enough in order to for it to be stable enough to make this jump over from games to actual environments where we can make maybe even money with it. So the biggest advancement seems to actually scale up with the hardware increase. This is something to consider. We need somewhere, how, somehow, if we if we are to keep, if we can keep up with the exponential rise of hardware, it's cool, but we probably aren't, especially with the Moore law dying every year. And uh, we need something that would make reinforcement learning 
need less experience. It would be more sample efficient. Then we can use reinforcement learning as a suggestion, as a fine tuning, fine tuning step on top of a supervised learning approach. For example, Alpha Zero did just that. First, they took, uh, not Alpha Zero, sorry, Alpha Star. First, they took the games that pro gamers played in StarCraft II. They trained their, they pre-trained their agents on uh, those games. So there you had actually ground truth. At this situation, this move is the best. Train your agent to do this move at this situation. And then on top of that, they did a reinforcement learning agent where the agent, uh, where the agents played against themselves. And this is how they achieved this subhuman uh, level of play. Superhuman is what I meant. <laughs> So reinforcement learning, not in and of itself, but on top of a supervised learning uh, approach. Something to consider. And there's a lot of potential in reinforcement learning transfer learning, because right, as of right now, it just is not existent. There are some papers that try to do this, but it doesn't get any further than a couple of papers, and even in those papers, it doesn't get any far. So if we can do that, then for example, me, I could just download a pre-trained policy and retrain the policy on a new task and be happy with it and do some research or tinkering or whatever. And if a lot of people in the world do that, then the field will advance much, much, much quicker. So we need something like an ImageNet model for or ImageNet data set rather for reinforcement learning because ImageNet is what kind of jump started the computer vision revolution in 2012. People just could download pre-trained networks, tinker a little with it, apply it to a new data set, and it just worked perfectly. And then lastly, we need more in general comprehensive environments. Environments are kind of like benchmarks. So ImageNet, because right now we have something like MNIST for reinforcement learning. These environments are pretty easy as we've seen. These environments are really easy. We have a really simple random search algorithm that solves the environment in a matter of hours. So in order to differentiate these simple algorithms from the difficult ones, from the sophisticated ones, we need something of a higher capacity, of a higher differentiating capacity, so to say, which is like ImageNet, for example, for computer vision. So. No solutions, a lot of problems, but no solutions. But if, or rather when, these solutions are gonna be presented and these problems are not, maybe not gonna be solved, but at least gonna be tackled on a little, maybe we'll have a reinforcement learning agent that doesn't hit into a wall. So remember I said that that was one of the most impressive applications of reinforcement learning. So the, infor the most impressive application looks like this. And hopefully, this figurative wall won't be a problem anymore, not only for this humanoid model, but for the bigger community of reinforcement learning agents, researchers, engineers, and hopefully we'll see reinforcement learning being employed to, for a greater good in the general world all over. With that, I end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, let's start with the questions. Um, thank you for that. I can agree on actually anything you mentioned. It's, it's quite the truth uh, from when I used to um, get in touch with reinforcement learning. Now the question is, and what I was missing is the robotics part. Um, not like full human need robotics, but smaller tasks and whatever you know. Um, can you tell us? How's, how's the current state with the robotics? Uh, I had the impression there are successful uh, appliances for that with reinforcement learning. Oh, and how far does it get for now? Yeah. Yeah. So what I didn't mention because I thought I wouldn't have time, but maybe I would have, yeah, I wouldn't have time, uh, is model free versus model based approaches. So model free is when you interact with a black box and model based is when you interact with the environment that you have a model of. And in robotics, you'd have a model because it's just physics is the model of the interaction. And this works much better, but it also works in simulation. Like, all the approaches that I know are first simulate the environment with the physics that you have, 
and then maybe transfer it to a real world like robot arm that you have. And sometimes that works, but like every single actual application, like KUKA robots or Boston Dynamics, they don't do reinforcement learning. They do basic uh, physical physics based uh, applications. <coughs> and uh, I really tried to find a robotics application that's more than just a toy. And I, I just couldn't. Uh, I was curious about the uh, augmented random search algorithm. Yeah. Do you know in the paper, um, did uh, it seems like they, it's kind of like the example you gave before, you, you kind of, they picked one example of the algorithm running and compared it against the other kind of pre-trained algorithms. Yeah. You didn't see like the convergence graph. Uh, do you think that, that if they were to, like if you were to actually compare it more rigorously, do you really think ARS would would beat out some of these more trained algorithms, or is there just not enough information about that right now? So what they did is uh, what I, and what I showed is not the convergence graph, but the performance over like hundred random seats to see the different, the vastly different performances. But the the thing is that in terms of the benchmark is the reward that you collect over a certain amount of steps. So you let I don't know hundred you let the environment do hundred steps you. And do this environment with a random search, or you do this environment with I don't know PPO, proximal policy optimization, and you see how many, uh, how much reward was collected with one algorithm, how much reward was collected with a different algorithm, and in the end, it was super surprising to me that it was not quite clear, but it was like not day and night. They were really, really close to each other. So sometimes the uh, actual random search won, sometimes the more sophisticated algorithms won, but it wasn't like I would expect the random search wor to work in different domains. Um, just for my own comprehension, yeah. am I to understand that the that one of the main problems with RL is is path dependency? Is what do you mean by path? Dependence? Well, you were talking about how at one point, and I only caught half of it because I was taking notes, um, how the action of the ah, agent yeah, I got, I yeah, gotcha. mm -hmm. uh, then influences yeah. the environment. If, in this, or, in yeah. this sense, yeah, the big problem is that, yeah, the path depends. Because if you, at the very beginning, you make some action, it actually influences the data collection process through the whole run until the terminal uh, point. So in this sense, it's it's very much a path dependency problem, yeah. and these these random effects influence the first step, and then it just piles on top of that. Uh, you mentioned the dynamic pricing problem at the beginning of your talk. I personally would be interested in your view on dynamic programming applications for these uh, problems. Well, for the, yeah, thank you. For dynamic programming, dynamic pro programming is a big uh, part of reinforcement learning, but for that you have to, what I just said, model based versus model free. For, for dynamic programming, you have to have a transition function. You have to know the probability of transition into a new state and the probability of receiving a reward with that transition. And it's really hard to do that. It's, it's, it's really, it's easy in a physics based environment because you have, for example, just the physics equations that uh, handle that for you. But uh, in terms of a I don't know, dynamic pricing approach, how do I predict if I set a price to P, how do I predict the expected reward of that action? And how do I predict the state that I'm going to be in after that action? I'm, I'm not really sure how, how, how do you even go about creating this kind of environment. An environment is basically what you need for reinforcement learning al algorithm to even work. Yeah, let's. Absolutely, yeah. Move it there. Thank you. Um, what type of, what areas of research or heuristic discovery algorithms are you personally interested in or encouraged by? I like model based approaches more right now. Because uh, they are tackling the sample inefficiency problem. Because, about, uh, like, I, I repeat myself, but for example, Alpha Zero is a model-based approach because it has the game of chess in itself. 
it knows if I do this step, it knows where I'll end up and where what my board will look like. But it's still if you have a model, it still doesn't mean that you know how to play well or optimally, because we all know how chess works, but we don't know how to win at chess. At least I don't. And uh, this I think is very is very um, promising field because it lets you plan ahead, and it means that you don't need to have just as much experience as if you would have with a random box or, or in a, sorry not random box but a black box kind of environment. So I think this is uh, this is something that we should as a community of people who are interested in reinforcement learning tackle on, and I think this is quite promising. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, recently, we saw examples of um, hide-and-seek mm -hmm. using reinforcement learning. Yeah. And these agents learn strategies. The question mm -hmm. is, how do you see applications in let's call it strategy search, maybe in game theory applications using reinforcement mm -hmm. learning, and whether you know something already on that yeah. area. Well, strategy is, in the sense, just a lookup for every state where, where do, what action do you take, right? And this is exactly what reinforcement learning is supposed to, to make, because at state S, it gives you like a probability or like a recommendation of steps that you need to take of all the possible actions. And in this sense, it is exactly this. But honestly, I don't, I don't know about this hide-and-seek thing strategy, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really able to answer this question. Um, all right. So yeah. we're writing time for okay. changing rooms, if you want. So let's thank Judy again, please. <laughs>